Each year, more than 46 million Americans will seek emergency room treatment for an accidental injury, most of which are preventable. So, what are your risks, and who can you trust to protect you? This is Safety Matters with Russ Kenzior. This is Russ Kenzior, joined by my producer, Tony. Hello. And as usual, we have a big show today. We do. And as usual, we always start with... Safety Matters in the news. In the news. What's in the news, Russell? Well, what else? But we always start with coronavirus. Yes. But we take a little bit different approach, as many of our listeners know. We, We cover the coronavirus issues that most media does not cover. For example, what state in the United States right now has the fastest growth of coronavirus positive tests in the United States? New York. Florida. You said Florida? Oh, wow. Hawaii. 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 Yeah, Hawaii is struggling. This is a uh, report put out by Fox News earlier this week. Hawaii is struggling with the highest rate of coronavirus transmission in the entire U.S., uh, leading one (laughs) expert to urge residents about importance of wearing masks. Here we go. Social distancing, according to a report this past Tuesday. The Aloha State. With the grass skirts. Yeah, this is a quote. The the Aloha State is currently seeing coronavirus cases spreading at a rate of 1.6, which means that for every person who gets sick, passes the virus to just over one and a half other individuals on average. No kidding. That's very high, Honolulu Mayor Kurt Caldwell told Hawaii News Now. Uh, the next worst state behind Hawaii is who? Who's number two? Seattle. 10? Oh, that, I mean. You're never going to get it. South Washington. Dakota. South ah, Dakota. Yeah. South Dakota. Yeah, they have a reproductive rate of 1.2. And what do you think number three is? Seattle. <laughs> They're both cities. No, it's Texas. Texas. <laughs> you got to get Texas in there. We're number three. Do you know that Seattle is not a state? Yeah, that's a good point, Tony. <laughs> it's Washington. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Texas it's a little, is it's Texas early is this the morning. state. Texas is the state, and uh, we're at third place with one point one six. Um, so, hey, there you go. It was uh, interesting. It's what's really fascinating is how they really have closed the state of Hawaii. I mean, it's an island, obviously, and it's really far away. So they really haven't had uh, anywhere near the type of transmissions we have, and it's been hard to get in and out of Hawaii. In fact, they closed down their tourism industry for months oh my goodness Uh, i had a friend who went to hawaii for a business trip and you got to tell them in advance you're coming a lot of prep work they when you land they they take your temperature they get your cell phone to know where you are they do some tracking of you they want to make sure you are where you're supposed to be they're they're very very stringent and have been for months but yet they now got the coronavirus even with all the great actions that they've taken it's been really, you know, kind of an epidemic of, of its own on the island nation. So, uh, yeah, they, they have 53% of their ICU beds are filled as of last week, according to their uh, state health director, Bruce Anderson, who also stated that Hawaii had announced it wouldn't reopen for tourism for out-of-state visitors until September 1st. Oh, boy. Yeah, and would welcome to enforce a 14-day quarantine for all out-of-state travelers who test negative for coronavirus. And this is a Fox News report. So they're number one. Uh, while we're on states, uh, Wisconsin, the Badger State, uh, Wisconsin State Agency, and this is another Fox News story, Wisconsin State Agency employees are to wear masks during Zoom calls, even when they're home alone. <laughs> Yeah, that, that's a little bit, uh, you know, it's kind of over the top. Well, you tend to think so. And I'm, again, I'm not certain how, what the safety benefit of that is, because who are you going to infect? The mic. <laughs> <laughs> the microphone. It says here, a Wisconsin state agency is reportedly mandating that its employees wear face masks during video conferences, even if they're home alone. In a July 31st email, the Department of Natural Resources Secretary Preston Cole reminded employees that the governor's mask order, which requires anyone over the age of four, not certain where that came from, to wear a face mask or face covering while indoors was to take effect until 
I'm sorry, take effect August 1st, the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel reported. So four-year-olds have to wear masks. Where do you find a four-year-old mask? I mean, that's a pretty small mask. Yeah, I know. Uh, by the way, there's been a little bit of revenge on coronavirus uh, from the country of Brazil. I don't know if you read this or not, but Brazil has sent China the coronavirus back, I guess you can say. Uh, this is another Fox News story that said a batch of frozen chicken wings exported from Brazil to China tested positive for coronavirus. Chinese officials reported Thursday. The infected poultry was discovered in the city of Shenzhen during routine screening screenings of import, imported meat and seafood, which has been carried out since June, the city government said in a notice. The screenings were implemented after a coronavirus outbreak in Beijing was linked to a seafood market. People who may have come in contact with the chicken wings along the food products stored near the, the batch were tested by Shenzhen's health authorities. All of the results came back negative. So, Brazil is paying China back, <laughs> or they're returning the coronavirus. So um, I guess that's a little bit of revenge. But we're also having to take the word of China. Ah, yes, that's true. Again, not not real certain how that works. How do you get frozen chicken from Brazil, which takes a while to get from Brazil to China, right? and still have that virus living on a frozen item it's a it's a super virus i mean how does that work i mean you can't in other words freezing doesn't kill the virus mm. I, huh. don't, I don't know uh fda expands its criteria for banned hand sanitizers remember we've been covering this one a lot the faa wants to prevent americans from using hand sanitizer uh, containing one propanol because it can be toxic and life-threatening when consumed Again, people drinking this stuff. This is a, another report out of CleanLink. According to an updated um, placed uh, updated story placed by the FDA or on the FDA's website, as a result, the FDA has added one propanol contaminated products to its rapidly growing do not use list, which we've been kind of updating everybody. Mm. Started out with 50, then it went to 75, 100. Now we're way over 150. Uh, the FDA says that one propanol causes harm to the in, to the central nervous system, including depression. Symptoms of one propanol exposure includes confusion, loss of consciousness, slowed pulse, and slow breathing. Mm. So right now we have over 150 hand sanitizers been banned, been banned. So we we can't be using them now. I don't know. I don't know. How do you know which san sanitizers? kind of banned. I mean, is what what I haven't heard is that the Consumer Product Safety Commission has been recalling these hand sanitizers. Is, isn't that something that you would expect they would be doing is yes. putting a recall out? I mean, if it's a dangerous product, right. why not recall it? Absolutely. But I don't know of anybody getting So recalled. no website showing which sanitizers are use in use or not? Well, again, how many people go to the FDA website to look this kind of stuff up? How would you ever know this? And how, and why isn't anybody reporting this? Right. And again, the, the story goes on to say that nearly 150 hand sanitizers have made their way uh, on the FDA's list, which I don't know how you would find it unless you go to their website, which was created in early uh, summer to prevent hand sanitizers from being sold in the U.S., some of um, the um, hand sanitizers were banned because they're not strong enough and don't work. <laughs> Others have been banned because they contain methanol, which, like one propanol, can be deadly. So, is it from ingesting it, or is it from just your from your hands? It's a like soak through. Both, your, mm. yeah, both. You can you can get sick by using it on your hands, and you can get sicker by drinking it. So it's it's a combination of both. But um, there has been a response. Distillers. This is another CleanLink.com story. Distillers have stopped manufacturing sanitizers. <laughs> Stick to what they know. Yeah, craft distillers are halting their production of the hand sanitizers uh, as demand for emergency supplies dwindle. A number of craft distilleries across the United States began making hand sanitizers several months ago as a way to help consumers get their hands on hygienic tools while also replacing some of the income they lost due to COVID-19 shutdowns. But uh, right now, there's not a lot of demand. Uh, it goes on to say that uh, regular manufacturers of hand sanitizers have caught up 
to demand and restock supply. So there's not much point in distillers continuing their efforts. One distiller tells uh, Florida News 4 Jax. Mm. So um, rough time, yes. different, difficult time. So when we come back, uh, we're going to be speaking with Rachel Cooper from the National Safety Council on mental health and the impact that that uh, is having on our country right now. So when we return, uh, we'll be speaking with her. And we'll be right back. You are listening to Safety Matters. This is America's Slip and Fall Guy, Russ Kens. You are welcome back to the show. I'm joined by two other local business people, uh, Brian and Adam, uh, who are employed in different industries and impacted by the coronavirus, uh, presumably in different ways. Uh, Brian, tell us a little bit about yourself and your business. Sure. I own a uh, a little mom and pop pack and ship in uh, Bedford, Texas. And, uh, you know, uh, we were considered an essential business, so we did get to stay open throughout. Um, that being said, coronavirus certainly impacted us. Now, when you say a mom and pop, meaning like a, like a UPS store type, I'm exactly. trying to envision. Okay, so you're getting packages, people coming in, shipping, and you're yep. receiving. Okay. Mailboxes uh, or notaries. We've got a few printers in there that do some fancy stuff and print stuff. Uh, you know, think peanuts, bubble wrap, mailboxes, that right. kind of stuff. So you're essential. How about you? Shipping infrastructure. Gotcha. How about you, Adam? Were you considered essential? Uh, we were not as a breakfast lunch restaurant uh, without a drive through, um, but we made ourselves essential by uh, doing curbside, uh, using our servers as delivery people any way we could. You know, sometimes it was only a couple hundred dollars a day in sales, but we kept the doors open until we could figure out ways to work through a lot of it and get back to being open you know to the 50 percent that we are now not having a drive-through is that a, a big problem for you as a restaurant uh it wasn't before this um <laughs> you know it would be nice now for what we do drive-through isn't you know uh, made from scratch isn't what drive-throughs do so um would i like one in the future probably not because that would be changing what we do but at the same time those that are set up for to go um, your wing places, your fast foods, the, even the quick service places that have drive throughs they obviously benefited um, from this because they were equipped to handle it a lot better than sit-down restaurants. Well, needless to say, as a restaurant, you've been negatively impacted significantly. So tell tell our, our listeners about what how, how coronavirus has changed <laughs> changed your life. Well, uh, first of all, it... it it uh, impacted us greatly from the standpoint of not being able to work um, the way that we have been as far as being able to put all my employees to their regular hours to be able to um, as myself as an, as an owner as a co-owner you know I didn't draw a salary for two months and even then when I came back on um, I drew a lot less than what I normally would um, it caused us to be creative in in a way to find sales. You know, we started doing dinners a couple nights a week just to try to be able to put some people to work. Uh, we were fortunate to get some help through the CARES Act, so we kept our doors open. We kept our employees staffed uh, and working as much as possible. Um, we've all taken pay cuts, um, and we're in this together. We truly are in this together, and. Um, you know, we lost a couple employees on the front of the house side just because, you know, it was probably beneficial to them to draw unemployment versus coming in and working two days a week and making, you know, half the tips if they were even working that. Um, but I'd say we're about 60% of where we normally would be right now. The only problem is eventually that CARES Act money runs out. Um are we going to be at 60% through the end of the year? That's kind of how I see it. I think best case scenario, maybe springtime, we can be operating at 100%, but, you know, can't tell the future. Yeah, who knows? Right. How about you, Brian? Well, we were in our first year. We opened last August. 
And so uh, we were still on our ramp up, uh, and this literally a startup business, and then this happened. And so uh, my business is all about a kind of accumulating people. It builds up over time. And the, the, the position we were in, we knew that we weren't going to be profitable uh, within the first year. Just as you hit a year, the way this thing works is you start becoming profitable at about a year. Well, coronavirus hit, you know, hits, and it slowed our, our ramp up quite a bit. Uh, what we ended up doing was making a pivot, uh, and what we pivoted to is we started stock, stocking mass. Uh, one of the things they taught us was uh, meet your community, your market, where it's at, and one of the needs we identified was mass. And so uh, fortunately we found a, a few different suppliers. I tried to find an American supplier that would deal with me. I'm too small. They want, you know, if you order masks from these guys, they want you to order like 5,000 at a time. Like, I don't have room for 5,000 masks. So unfortunately, I had to go overseas for my masks. Um, but anyways, we started stocking a bunch of different flavors of masks, and that helped quite a bit. I'm going to play a little uh, clip for you uh, from Dr. Fauci, and, and I'm just curious what your um, take is on this. I know it's difficult, but we're having a lot of suffering, a lot of death. This is inconvenient from an economic and a personal standpoint, but we just have to do it. Um, inconvenient. I mean, your businesses, has this been an inconvenience for you, Adam? Absolutely. I, you know, for, um, for bar owners and friends of mine that have been in the industry for a long time, um, people that own craft breweries and places like that i can't imagine what they're going through because it's beyond inconvenient it's you know a friend of mine that owns a brewery just laid off half of his staff and you know the way the the licensing is set up and everything they can't even open their patio even though they have a huge patio man they could at least be doing that and they're not able to and and it's it's very unfortunate because i think that industry, that side of the industry is going to be probably not coming back from this. I think it's too much to recover from. Yeah, and that's the reason I asked the question about inconvenience. Is there's some people who have actually benefited or are prospering. Um, big companies, restaurants that have drive throughs because everybody's kind of driving through. Um, Walmart, Amazon, uh, PPE people, Brian. Yep. They've done pretty well. Um, but then there's people who have been wiped out. Your friend who's a owns a brewery. I mean, they're shut down. And, and how much can you, you know, really ride this, this out? Um, but the inconvenience, Brian, what's your thoughts on, is this simply an inconvenience or is this a disaster? Or are you somewhere, where are you? I'm in between. Uh, we're fortunate that in the market that we're in, and uh, because of the remote stuff, people are shipping a lot of stuff these days. And so I'm right in the middle of that. Um, of course, I get all the Amazon returns coming through my store, but you know, I don't necessarily make any money on that, but that definitely brings foot traffic in. Um, on the other side of like my business, I'm also a technical consultant, and that I can tell you a little bit about. And this is a big company like ERPs and document management systems, the cloud. Mm -hmm. We're doing great. We just hired 50 people. And, and, and the reason why is we're fashioning systems to basically like this office building that we're in so that people don't need to be in them anymore. Mm. And uh, so we're building the accounting systems, the ERPs, the document man, all that stuff that would normally be happening in an office like the one we're sitting in doesn't need to happen. We've digitized it all, and it's all up in the cloud. And so that, that part of the business, that's why if you watch like Microsoft and, or some of those other guys, uh, they're doing absolutely – I mean, Microsoft's getting ready to spend, what, billions of dollars on something that takes like pictures on your camera you know i mean they're just looking for stuff to spend their money on at this point so there's again there's winners there's losers uh, the economy is changing um business is changing yep. it seems like the small business self-employed businesses are the most vulnerable they're the least likely to consider this simply an inconvenience but more of a crisis or disaster primarily because they don't really know what the future holds and i guess that's my question uh, adam what does the future hold for your business I, I I don't know how to answer that. I, I don't have an answer. I don't see it. Um, I don't see it changing anytime soon, uh, unless for some reason, you know, numbers go down long enough, fast enough to where Abbott decides, hey, let's let's get back on with this opening. Of course, going to seventy five percent doesn't do anything for 
anybody when you're still doing six foot tables and social distancing and everything else that goes along with that for restaurants. And people are scared, aren't they? You yeah. hear that? I mean, you see that a lot in both your businesses. Are people? I mean, your customers yeah. scared? Some are. Some I had a guy walk in today. You know, didn't want to wear a mask. Asked him to wear a mask. Kind of scoffs at me. And you, know, <laughs> you have those guys, and then you have others that you know know that. It's not our choice to do this. We have to, you know, or otherwise we're the ones paying the fine, not you. So, you know, let's just follow along and get through this as quick as possible. But um, it, it is scary times because, you know, I'm a numbers guy and I like to foresee and forecast and, and run budgets and see where we're going to be at. And, um, you know, it needs to turn around sooner than later. Yeah, we need some some certainty, some security. I think that there are precautions that can be had and every business can stay open. I do believe that, at least at the 25%, the 50%. I mean, these guys would love to be open just a little bit. I'm, I, and, I get and they that, can't. Yeah. You know? well, I think everybody feels uh, a lot of sympathy for business owners, especially if you are one or no one. Um, again, if you work for the government, you work for a big company, you work from home, life is a little bit different for you. But if you're running a business and you don't know if your you know, bacon is going to arrive or your eggs or your, how you make the rent payment, it's a different world. And, it, and, and I guess what you're saying, you're both saying, is we just really all can't wait to get back to normal. Yeah. Can't wait to get back to normal. But I appreciate you guys coming out, telling us your story today. Um, wish you the best. Um, you know, I know it's a tough time, and uh, I view it as more than just an inconvenience. I think this is a lot bigger problem than just a, a blip, because um, there's a lot of people whose lives are going to be forever changed by this. We're all going to remember 2020, aren't we? Absolutely. It's going to be a long, a long time <laughs> before, we, yeah, before we forget this. I don't but, think it's even done with us yet. Yeah, well, thanks for cheering me up. You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> all right, guys. Well, thanks for coming out today. Um, appreciate it, and uh, really wish you all the best. Hope... Uh, this works out well for you. Thank you. Thank you. As most of you know, I've been an uh, active supporter of the National Safety Council and in fact been a member for over 25 years. I serve on the Board of Delegates of the NSC. Many of you know it as the Green Cross based out of Itasca, Illinois. Uh, joining me this morning is Rachel Cooper, Senior Program Manager for Substance Use Harm Prevention at the National Safety Council. Uh, good morning, Rachel. Good morning. Thank you for having me. No, my pleasure. Uh, the issue of substance abuse, mental health, seems to be very complicated but growing. Uh, first, tell, tell the audience who you are and something about the National Safety Council. Sure. Like you said, um, I'm Rachel Cooper. I'm the Senior Program Manager for all things related to opioids, substances, mental health, etc. cetera, um, at the National Safety Council. My background is in direct service, working with people who have opioid use disorders and substance use disorders. And one of the things that I'm extremely passionate about and really believe in strongly is the role that the employer can play in supporting employees who are struggling with substance use or addiction, mental health, mental illness, etc. We know that over 75% of people with a substance use disorder are employed. So this is a problem that affects not only employees, but employers. And it's certainly something that employers can make a huge difference in um, as they as they progress through helping their employees and general employee support and well-being. About the National Safety Council, so the National Safety Council is America's leading nonprofit safety advocate, and we've been that for over 100 years. So we're a mission-based organization, and we focus on eliminating the leading causes of preventable deaths so that people can live their healthiest, fullest lives. So we focus our efforts, of course, where we can make the greatest impact, and those three areas are safety in the workplace, safety on the roadways, and then all sorts of safety related to impairment and well-being. Well, it's interesting. A lot of people um, think of the National Safety Council, or when they hear the National Safety Council, they think of it as a government agency, which it's, it, it is not. In fact, it predates any other formal uh, government agency regarding safety, like OSHA, for example. Before there was OSHA, there was a National Safety Council that really led the campaign in the United States for workplace 
uh, safety, and it and it's really grown uh, quite a bit. And and to kind of unpack this issue of of mental health, I know there's opioids, there's alcohol, um, they relate to suicides. We are in the world of of the coronavirus. Um, are there? You know, I read a story the other day that said that one out of three people working from home are are actually drinking while they're working at home. Have you heard that? Yeah, I've heard that. I think that, you know, anecdotally, I think we can all say that um, we, uh, our alcohol use has changed. I mean, some people don't drink at all and maybe that hasn't changed. And if so, that's great. But anecdotally, I mean, especially, you know, in those early months when I live up in the Northern Midwest, I live in Wisconsin, um, it was cold. And when you're home and you have nothing to do and you're stuck at home, I mean, it's a very easy thing to to have another drink than maybe one more than you normally would or whatever. I do think that, you know, in terms of the workplace um, aspect of it, you know, if you're if you're referring more to drinking during the day, um, I don't know if that's something that's increased. I think that, you know, we talk about that, but we can also talk about things like, well, how many of us, you know, and like obviously the National Safety Council, we have very strong policies regarding this, but many workplaces might go out to lunch and have a beer over lunch. Right. And what does right. that actually look like in terms of safety? What does that actually look like in terms of, you know, culture accept- cultural acceptability? Like I said, at NSC, obviously that is not a thing that we, you know, endorse, condone, or allow our employees to do. But it's, it's certainly something that I can see um, – employees of other agencies taken home and just thinking, hey, maybe it's okay. And when you're at home and your boundaries are all sorts of weird and you've got people running around behind you or, you know, it's a stressful time and it just, it just, it kind of messes with your head. What's normal, you know? So I can certainly see it. Uh, Is there, is there any age group that's more vulnerable to this than, uh, than another? (sighs) Well, yes and no. So that's a, it's a complicated question. I mean, in that, you know, when you talk about this, and I'm just going to backtrack a little bit. I want to just make sure that we're clear a little bit on how some of these things that you mentioned, you know, mental illness, mental health, addiction, substance use, et cetera, is all, you know, tied together. So a lot of these things um, have very similar risk and protective factors. And just a little bit about what that means. So a risk factor is obviously something that puts us more at risk for something, right? So when we're talking about substance use, when we're talking about mental health, we're talking about things like, do we have family histories of mental illness or substance use? Do we have um, exceptional levels of stress or childhood trauma? Do we, you know, have unstable housing, unstable employment, et cetera? All of those are risk factors um, for, uh, you know, potentially developing a substance use disorder, um, having mental health issues, et cetera. Again, protective factors really oppose those and they, those decrease the risk. And that's, you know, like healthy diet, exercise, of course. And there's like those individual things that you can do as a person to kind of protect yourself. But there's still the systemic factors that highly impact as well. And that's not something that you as a person can really change. I mean, you can do what you can, but you have to talk about, you know, workplace stress. Um, do you have reliable support from family and friends? Do you have, you know, good coping skills, et cetera? And I think that, you know, With the COVID-19 pandemic, what we're really seeing is that, first of all, we have all had to lean exceptionally heavily into our coping skills and our coping mechanisms, whatever those may be. And those are different for every person. For some people, you know, if you your coping mechanism really relates to the gym and going to the gym and working out or maybe fitness classes and that was shut down for you, that's now something that has been taken away from you. You know, on the other hand, if your coping mechanism was going out for drinks with friends and venting, that's also been shut down and taken away. So we've all been kind of just reframing every step of the way. And, you know, for some of us, that's easier than others. Um so that that's really where a lot of this uh, kind of comes together. And then, you know, no matter no matter how you how you frame it, at the end of the day, you know, we know that the COVID nineteen pandemic is going to have very serious psychological and social effects on all of us. I mean, it's going to persist for months and years to come because this impacts all of us differently. And uh, distress, anxiety, you know, fear of the virus itself. Um, you know, some people experience you know insomnia and fatigue. Certainly impacts your capacity to be safe. It certainly impacts you know your way to your your capacity to like process stress. Um, we don't know what's going to happen here in terms of the long term effects. So when we're talking about age, you know, I think that we're definitely going to see that this impacts different age groups differently. Um, You know, kids, school, college age kids and their school, you know, the working age population who unemployment potentially furloughs, all of these things are going to impact us differently in terms of, you know, the actual age differential when we talk about things like opioid overdose fatalities we do see that those rates 
you know, have increased and decreased at different rates, depending on your metro area, depending on if you're urban or rural, depending on, you know, what type of drug we're talking about. Like, are we talking about prescription opioids or are we talking about synthetic opioids like fentanyl? So, you know, we can get really targeted with our interventions, but at the end of the day, you know, those, those, you know, we're going to have to do some blanket actions like increasing accessibility to treatment, ensuring that employers are covering treatment with their insurance plans, ensuring that Medicaid um, and Medicare are covering these options as well for people who aren't on employer-sponsored insurance plans, which is a lot of people, and, you know, making sure that the, the support systems for our youth are exceptionally strong as well as they navigate their way out of the pandemic and its social and psychosocial impacts. Wow. I mean, so as we're all avoiding each other by staying in our homes right. <laughs> to avoid getting the, the coronavirus we're actually bringing upon ourselves personally, obviously a lot of stress, personal stress. I mean, a lot of people are like working, raising their kids, having to teach yep. their kids. They got the dogs, they got the housework. Uh, in many cases, it's a husband and wife both working out of a home that they don't really have the right facilities. They don't have the right you know, technology, for example, internet, phone, et cetera. And so there's a tremendous amount of stress. And again, hopefully the country will open up and, uh, and let people kind of escape their homes and, and, and build a healthier life. Uh, last question I have for you is tell us a little bit about what the National uh, Safety Council is doing to, uh, to help people. Sure. And I, I just want to circle back on something that you just said. I, I think that the, the flip side of you know, the, the country reopening question is a really complex one because there are so many factors that go into this, like you said, when you have your, how, your home life is so stressful. Um, but we do also know that there is a lot of fear and anxiety that surrounds going back into the workplace and is that safe? So if you are a person who is immunocompromised or if you're in a certain age bracket, the fear and anxiety about returning to work is going to, it might be more important than anything else because you feel like X, Y, and Z, or you might have a partner or a loved one in your household who, if you go back to work, you might be putting them at risk. So that's part of why the National Safety Council um, developed the, the SAFER initiative, which is Safe Actions for Employee Returns, which is a comprehensive, multifaceted effort to really guide employers through the process of safely resuming traditional work and operations now, you know, while this is still going on. And then what does that look like in the post pandemic phase? So that has everything to do from like physical, you know, restructuring of the work to test, you know, contact uh, tracing and testing to what I talk about, which is, has a lot to do with mental health and substance use. And what we're really, what we're really seeing is that the, the, the response has been very patchwork depending on states, depending on the government. And that's not a criticism, it's just a comment. So employers are often very confused about what they should or should not be doing. And that's, you know, there's a lot of, I encourage all of the listeners to check out um, the SAFER initiative at nsc.org slash SAFER. Again, that's nsc slash org slash backslash SAFER. I'm sorry, to make sure that, you know, the most up-to-date information is available there. There's a series of webinars where we have leading, you know, NIOSH and CDC participants, you know, keeping us up to date on what's best. We have risk assessments to make sure that your workplace is as safe as possible because as the country reopens, there are many, many different types of safety to navigate, many different things to focus on. So I just want to make sure that everybody listening has a chance to check that out. Um, there's a lot of information there. We do recommend that you pull in a solid group from your employee, uh, um, from your workplace including leadership, including HR, including your safety professionals, if you have them, um, just to make sure that all of those teams are aligned and creating the most robust response possible. So uh, go ahead. No, no, no. Excellent point. And um, again, we've been speaking with Rachel Cooper, Senior Program Manager for Substance Use Harm Prevention at the National Safety Council. Uh, appreciate you spending time with us today to, to yeah. cover this uh, very important issue of mental health. Uh, suicide, opioid abuse, any any form of um, substance mm -hmm. abuse. So I really appreciate you uh, you coming on the show today, and um, and thank you for all the work you do. Oh, absolutely. Um, I, I just want to you know close by saying a couple a couple things real quick. One is that you know when we're when we're talking about especially responding to you know the COVID nineteen pandemic, we're talking very much about being reactive. What are we going to do right now? So you know we're talking about. Um, you know, managing, you know, employee stress and anxiety, what kind of short term policies might we have in place as far as, you know, um, flexible work schedules, you know, what are we going to get from our EAP? How can we enhance our benefits? But we also know that we're looking at the potential of having 
these mental health impacts continue to impact the workplace for months and years to come. So this is the time to start really thinking about what does it mean to have a psychologically safe workplace? What does it mean to have a mentally safe workplace? Can my employees who are any workplace's biggest asset is the employees. Can they ask for help and get help if they need it? Do they know what to look for in themselves? And that's a complicated thing because when we're all stressed and when we're all feeling, you know, really up to here, it's it's not an easy thing to take a step back and be like, hey, maybe I should ask for some help. You know, there's a lot of mechanisms in place. People might not trust that it's confidential. So I, I really highly encourage everybody to check out, you know, the varying mental health resources and webinars that we've got up on the Safer page to really take a look at not only where where do we go with the COVID-19 pandemic, but how do we continue and who do you need to have engaged? And we have a lot of excellent partners who are part of um, our task force who have you know partner resources up there. And I encourage you to take a look and, you know, of course, reach out if you have any questions, because that's what the National Safety Council is here to do is to support people as they try to create a safe workplace. Thank you. You summed it up well. And we'll be posting some information on the Facebook page, uh, which you can get in touch with Rachel and learn more about mental health. Stay tuned for more Safety Matters. This is Russ Kenzior with my producer, Tony. And I'm Tony B. Welcome back. We have been spending a lot of time talking about coronavirus, primarily since that is the number one safety health issue in the world. It's on every channel, every news program. I mean, every it's on everybody's mind right now. Yeah, I mean, it has literally just um, scared the dickens out of everybody pretty much across the planet. Absolutely. I was in Austin uh, this past week and uh, can't tell you how incredibly insistent on in the stores and uh in every public place and and it's almost uh shunned upon if you're not wearing a mask it, we we really have changed as a country they look at you different like if you don't have a mask and i'm outside in the sun in a parking lot mm. and they look at you like where's your mask yeah you know and, and that's i don't know if that's going to change I, yeah. I think our society is now for many, many months to come, going to be socially distancing all the time. I yeah. mean, some people don't want to shake hands. That might go away, as Dr. Fauci kind of wished it would. Uh, we judge each other by, are you wearing a mask or not? Right. Not certain about the real effects of that, but nonetheless, we are being judged. And I'm not certain even after the election, this is going to go away because people are scared. I mean, we have really conditioned the American people to be so fearful of each other. I mean, we look at each other almost like zombies, like you know, get, don't don't get close to me. Here's what I think. I think if uh, Trump wins, it still continues. Yeah, yeah. If Biden wins, it goes away. Well, I don't think it's going away. Is my point. I don't think. I don't think it's oh, going to go away. Use, they might use it to continue on that fear. Yeah. All right. There's there's now states governors using safety, specifically the coronavirus, as a tool to empower. You know, keep us in place, keep people in place. And I don't know if the American people are going to uh, stand for that. Oh, I'm so scared. Yeah, I, I don't know. I wear my mask. I mean, there's things to be as things to be scared of. Uh, this this is something that um, it was so unusual. I had a conversation with a, a friend of mine who's a medical doctor, and he said, you know, we never kept track of how many people a day tested positive for the flu. We never kept track of how many people a day were dying from the flu. And had we done that, it probably would would show very similar. Similar, sure, I'm sure of it. But nobody gave you know two yeah. thoughts of it. But for the coronavirus, it's it's again changed the world. We um, and, and corporations and a lot of companies yeah. uh, have really changed. But as you you implied in the very beginning, we we are safety matters. Yeah, and you know I. I, I find myself um, kind of in this quandary where in my in my line of work as an expert witness, I work with many, many different companies on um, matters of litigation. I also do consulting work with with companies on fall prevention, slip and fall prevention. And a story came to mind a number of years ago. I was invited to uh, the headquarters of a large home improvement retail store 
Uh, and they had an interest in preventing falls in their store. And I flew out to their headquarters while I was downstairs in the lobby waiting for the meeting <clears throat> to be called. I um, was reading their annual report. They actually had their annual report on the desk and the reception desk. And I started reading. And it looked like a, it looked like a National Geographic magazine, just a gorgeous report. Mm. And during the course of reading through the report, I couldn't help but find on page like two – uh, a photograph of their employees standing, you know, next to each other with their arms folded across their chest. And at the title, it said, safety is number one. Safety is number one. That's good. Yeah, it was great. And uh, again, a lot of corporations will do that. A lot of big companies will talk openly about safety. But this was an interesting story because when I did get up to the executive offices and sit down with some of the senior uh, officers of the corporation, I brought the annual report up with me and I said, look, I couldn't help but notice the data that you were putting into your annual report about everything about the company the profit you know p l all, all, the, all the information about the company assets that sort of thing i said but uh, look on page two it has this beautiful photograph of your employees with their hands folded arms folded across their chest saying safety is number one they all agreed oh yeah safety is a big deal it's a big deal i said well great because it's a big deal to me but when i was going through your annual report i couldn't find any line item that would break down how much money you spend on safety. I mean, mm. if it's number one, right? Should be up there. Uh, you'd know it. Mm -hmm. And so I asked them, how much money you spend on safety? And they said, well, we spend a lot. Well, how much? Quite a bit. Well, what do you spend it on? Well, we spend it on a lot of things. Look, Tony, I've been around the block. Right. That's not, from an, from an executive of a corporation who's going to dance that dance, that ain't going to work. So I, <laughs> I said, look, if safety is number one, you should know that. Because I, I can go through your annual report and find how much money you spent on just about everything. I could probably find how much money you spent on toilet paper if I looked hard enough. And by the way, that's number two. <laughs> well, they didn't think that was funny. And so <laughs> what I said to them was, you talk about safety being a big deal, but it appears to only be a big deal to your shareholders, meaning you're trying to tell your shareholders. Yeah, it's the uh, lip service. It's the... right we want to look this way. Right. And that's what I said is if you're serious about safety, you want to prevent injuries and you really are willing to invest in that. I'm, I'm here to help you put your money where your mouth that's is. That's right. But if you're going to tell me, well, it's really a big deal, but we don't even know how much we budget for it. Then obviously it's not a big deal. It's like saying, Hey, I, you know, the most important thing to me is my children. Well, really, you know, what, what, what baseball team is your nine-year-old on? Oh, oh, I don't know. Whoa. When's the last game you went to? Um, uh. Right. And, you know, again, if you're going to prioritize something, then be honest about it. That's right. And that's sadly, sadly what I find a lot with companies across the country is the, the lip service, the talking about it. And in part, this kind of overlaps with coronavirus. You know, people are working from home. They're distance learning. This this whole approach to safety uh, is such, specifically with coronavirus, that we're not even certain the lockdown worked. In fact, there's evidence to show that the lockdown hasn't helped at all. And so we may have just crippled ourselves, crippled our society. Certainly, we're not helping our children. I mean, they should be allowed to to go back into school. There's no evidence to show that there's anything unsafe about children returning to the classroom as well as teachers returning to the classroom, assuming the teachers are under the age of 70, which presumably they would be. So what's the big scare? How is how is the long-term impl implications of this going to really play out? And again, like my example with, with the corporations that I, that I work with, you, know, we, we, you got to be honest with yourself. I mean, really, what, what is this all about? Where are we headed? What's the big picture? What's the long-term consequences of this? Because it really could be very troubling. In fact, next week, we're going to be speaking with Ralph Nader on transportation safety. There we go. He'll be joining us for a uh, interview about what's going on in the world of transportation safety. Also, for our listeners, we have a new website. Amen. Yeah, it's a new website called thesafetymattersshow.com. Would encourage everybody to go there. Our social media links are now up on the site, both Twitter and Facebook. And so if anybody has any questions, they can uh, send us a message. As I mentioned earlier, the National Safety Council uh, link is going to be on our Facebook page. So those of you who have an interest in learning more about mental health, 
uh, issues. Uh, there's a lot of webinars and seminars going to be up on the social media site. Uh, you can do that. Or if you would like, you can send me an email, russ at thesafetymattersshow.com. And so if you have any questions or comments or show ideas, give me a call. Yes. Let us know. Let I us think hear that's from good. You. I think that's uh, it's a good way to wrap up this uh, this show. It was good, Russ. Well, when, uh, when we come back next week, as I said, we're going to be speaking with Ralph Nader and be covering um, some... Some interesting new information that's percolating out of the media. What's happening in safety. What's happening in the news. So when we return next week. Well, this brings another show to a close. Do you have a question or would like to suggest a safety-related topic for us to talk about? We'd love to hear from you. Please visit the show's website at thesafetymattersshow.com, where we also have links to our Facebook and Twitter feeds. 